I've been troubled by something elemental. An unfamiliar truth that didn't appear to be of our time. One that seemed ingrained in a collective memory of a past existence. A distant, innate instinct recollecting a long forgotten way of life. This feeling started out many years ago. I don't recall exactly when, but it began with a nagging pulse within the depths of my mind. A virtual headache, absent of any physical pain, but with a repetitious and annoying calling. Not subtle at all, this phenomenon soon escalated from the internal and towards real physical and emotional manifestations. At times, embodying a euphoric weightlessness, while at others, an overwhelming and massive sense of guilt. Later on, words were spoken, not out loud, but as inner duels between my conscious mind and its counterpart. My new adversary appeared more naturally prepared and superior in wisdom than I. I wasn't sure of what to expect, a fight seemed inevitable, one that involved a reluctant confrontation with my deepest fears, fears of survival, fears of pain and suffering. Should I take flight? No, I held fast. Day by day, I felt my adversary's strength increase while mine dissipated. The struggle commenced, and in what felt like eons of suspended time, Mere seconds had elapsed. And in those terrifying moments, many exhausting battles were lost. And with every loss, a pillar of my life's beliefs and conventions crumbled. And on that final day, I lost the life-changing war, totally vanquished. Yet in those seconds of entire defeat, in that absolute nothingness, a light breached the darkness and a victory was born. When fear was overcome and how then, freedom took over the uninhabited emptiness. The genesis of my new yet ancient sense was complete. Hunger was reborn and now, yes now, I finally understood its true purpose. Not as the sensation triggering fears of starvation or survival, a power that would overwhelm my existence. No, but a force of nature at least equal to my other sources of existential perception, like sight, touch, taste, smell, and hearing. This was a sense to be welcomed, one to be empowered by. They used to be five, and now I had six. Little did I know, more were about to be revealed. My whole being was about to be reinvented. I'm not alone in my connection to hunger. Many people all over the world make a connection with the sense of hunger all the time, but only through its much milder iteration, fasting. This rise in awareness of fasting has been happening all around us throughout our recent history, yet now it is gaining exponential momentum. We yearn for the benefits of an improved well-being, but are unaware of the real and significant advantages it can grant us. In order for us to understand the true essence of our current relationship with hunger, we have to go back in time. And I mean way back. But let's take our time in rewinding our story from the unknown beginnings to the very ends. Let's take a look at how, along our history, fasting has been introduced over and over again. The first documentation of fasting in history are within the texts of the Ayurvedic traditions 8,000 years ago. Fasting formed an integral component of a natural healing system. The practice intended to cleanse the organs that are responsible for our senses and help people be more aware of their rested mind and body. 5,000 years ago, in ancient Egypt, 
Fasting was for 30 days a year that involved refraining from food and water from dawn till dusk. Moral well-being and self-discipline were the intentions of their practice. Fasting was a regular practice in the life of the prophet Moses over 4,500 years ago. Immediately following two specific instances of 40-day fasts, significant consequences came into being. The first fast resulted in the revelation of the Ten Commandments, while the second atoned for the sins of his people, saving them from the wrath of God. Atonement and cleansing were outcomes of fasting. With the founding of Judaism 3,000 years ago, fasting was indoctrinated within the laws of the first Abrahamic religions. In addition to the full fasts of Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av, 25-hour fasts that last from dusk till dusk on the following day, Jews had four additional fast days that extended from dusk till dawn. Atonement was again the intention of the Jewish practice. Around 2,500 years ago, fasting became intercontinental. During the classical period of ancient Greece, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were followed by Hippocrates and Pythagoras as leading promoters of fasting. Also following the ritual of a 40-day fast, these luminaries targeted purification, heightened mental capacity, and expanded perspective as their ultimate goals. In parallel, Buddhism introduced fasting as a daily way of life that started from noon till dawn the following day, a precursor of today's intermittent fast. Buddhists looked to achieve self-control through their fasting practices. And within the same era, Hinduism was founded and further established the practice of fasting, not as a religious imposition, but as an act towards the elevation of mind and spirit. In China, Confucius claimed that fasting brought forth an inner unity, granting the ability to hear with your whole being. With the rise of Christianity 2,000 years ago, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the desert to confront temptation and attain the highest level of moral code and discipline. Fasting in its true sense gradually took a lesser role within the religion and ultimately didn't achieve a place within the biblical canons of the faith. Galen, the Roman physician and philosopher 1800 years ago, shifted the application of fasting from the religious and cleansing to the world of medicine at the time. Fasting was now also therapy for the illnesses of the body. With the birth of Islam 1500 years ago, fasting took a much larger role in the faithful's daily lives. Ramadan, as one of the five pillars, extended for a full lunar month and was adhered to from dawn till dusk. In following the example of the Prophet Muhammad, Muslims also could practice other optional daily fasts of similar duration throughout the weeks of the year. In the 9th century, Native American Mississippian culture had incorporated fasting throughout their ceremonial life. Fasts lasted up to four days, and their purpose was to achieve a cleansed mind, body, and spirit prior to any ceremony, so that the chance of success was at its greatest. In the Incan Empire six centuries ago, a civilization updated its relationship with fasting as a form of penitence and feeling remorse for the civilization's sins. During the Golden Age of Islam, 1,000 years ago, Avicenna, in his book The Canaan of Medicine, further defined the role of fasting as a therapeutic practice that could cure illnesses and help the body and mind position themselves to combat disease. The Renaissance in the 15th century saw an age of enlightened thinkers who believed in the therapeutic value of fasting. These personalities included great luminaries like Leonardo da Vinci and Paracelsus. The latter identified fasting as the greatest healer and the physician within. Just under 250 years ago, the Orientalism movement brought back the cultures of the Silk Road to Europe, and with this import from the East, came a renewed Western societal attraction to fasting as a medical solution, healing the body through its own capacities. Within the Age of Enlightenment, at the end of the 18th century, a group of revolutionary thinkers believed and espoused in the body being the ultimate healer of its own maladies. Fasting was an integral practice of medical therapy during this era, with Benjamin Franklin one of fasting's many famous enthusiasts. In the United States, the natural hygiene movement of the 1830s reintroduced therapeutic fasting 
in which fasting is used to either treat or prevent ill health. This movement later evolved in Europe as the Nature Cure Movement at the back end of the century. During the Christian Third Great Awakening at the end of the 19th century, a rebirth of religious fervor across much of the world saw a new commitment to faith. This refreshed commitment to the Christian faith led to a renewed connection to fasting. In the mid 20th century, and with the energetic rise of New Age spirituality, fasting shifted again outside of religious dogma and towards our individual betterment. Human beings were now looking to enhance their lives through our various dimensions of mind, body, and soul. The health consciousness and wellness movements of the late 20th and early 21st centuries established a stronger force for change pertaining to fasting. One of the achievements of these movements was shifting fasting from the eccentric or strictly religious and towards mainstream application. Fasting was being supported by the powerful trifecta of medical, academic and corporate worlds. And finally, we arrive back to our day and age, when many varieties of fasting are being introduced. We have fasting in the form of an intermittent system be it a 5 plus 2 fasting days weekly cycle, an 18 hour daily fasting cycle, or a more open-ended eat, stop, eat approach. Regardless of the variation, we have finally arrived at the true definition of fasting, meaning the intentional cessation of any food consumption within a specific period of time. But before Ayurveda, did fasting exist in any variation? There's no doubt that fasting did exist. If we look back at fasting preceding the days of Ayurveda and rewind our existence to many eons ago, when human beings lived as hunter-gatherer, will discover that hunger ruled this era, a time when the unavailability of food was a constant challenge. Weather, migration, and simple bad luck impacted humans' ability to source their necessary sustenance. Hunger at this point in time was a very familiar condition, a part of our life routine, functioning as a recurring signal that starvation was imminent and survival in question. As much as it was frightening, hunger was also the subconscious birth source for numerous survival tools that have been lost over time. These tools, or senses as we would end up calling them, have been limited to the conventional five senses over the last three millennia. Hearing, sight, smell, touch and taste. We look at our senses today and appreciate their complexity and brilliance, but are extremely resistant in accepting that this was never the norm during our longer history. We are preconditioned to think that these five are all we ever had. But would we have survived our hunter-gatherer days with only these five senses? Probably not. Existing within the hunter-gatherer world could not rely on such a small composition of data collection receptacles. Fortunately for our ancestors, hunger opened up an expanse of senses beyond our imagination. There was more magic to our reality. Through these extended and heightened abilities, we would come to establish and appreciate our perception of the world, contemplate our place within the universe, and more importantly, survive above all other species. To source food through hunting, humans had to expose themselves to physical and mental challenges that could cause them great harm, or at worst, cost them their lives. With their primitive physical tools, Hunters had to depend on internal senses and abilities to overcome larger, faster, and stronger prey. Hunger was a powerful motivator on two fronts, protection from the hunted and sustenance for the group. To achieve both, hunger provided gifts, and these came in the form of focus, timing, telepathy, equilibrioception, and proprioception. As gatherers, the intensity of the hunt gave way to marathons of foraging, a significantly more time-consuming exercise. Longer hours were demanded in covering vast landscapes to provide both for themselves and their small community. 
the terrains were not always fruitful. Nourishment returns per hour foraged were very low. As gatherers, movement slowed down and humans went from being hunters to the hunted. Extreme danger was a reality that could materialize at any moment. Hunger provided the necessary senses and defense mechanisms to perform best at gathering. Some of these abilities included will, stamina, thermoception, echolocation, electrolocation, and magnetoreception. The state of hunger provided human beings the critical tools to be adept and more successful at quenching their survival needs. Recent discoveries of various ancient cultures confirmed that the modern convention of five senses was a limited approach to humanity's vast ability to engage with each other as well as with their surroundings. As late as 5,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians believed in a more widespread range of human senses and documented them in number at 365. Recently, scientists have started qualifying many more human senses with some studies identifying them at 10 and others up to 60 in number. When and why did we lose so many senses and abilities? Did we experience a moment of devolution? What happened to us? We used to be superhumans. Our elevated existence was being fed by hunger. Humanity perceived hunger as the great bearer of gifts and a major reason for our successful survival throughout our long history. But how did it come about, stopping being superhumans? 15,000 years ago, the human population numbered at between four to six million worldwide. These figures were steady over the previous several millennia and were more or less capped by the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. 13,000 years ago, a phenomenal eruption in number of global inhabitants demanded a new solution for the supply of food. The hunter-gatherer approach appeared to be an unsustainable option. Around 12,000 years ago, the advent of agriculture changed everything. Our existence literally slowed down to a full stop. The traditional on-the-move hunter-gatherer lifestyle was abandoned for a life on a settlement. As humans rested their hopes on a new but supposedly predictable source of sustenance, the beginning of the end of our superhuman status drew to a close. The fast twitch hunts for food decreased exponentially as the risks far outweighed any reward. Gone were the days of these challenging hunger-driven adventures that demanded the absolute highest in dynamic physical performance and unlocked the upper limits of our mental aptitude. Animals that were hunted in the wild and were gatherers in their own right also stopped in their tracks as they became domesticated. The event of domestication introduced a safe and steady supply of human nourishment, but also invited in a major cause of weakened immune systems and subsequent disease. The marathons of gathering were reinterpreted as shorter and nearer forays into the non-farming wilderness. The senses that were once necessary for survival and endurance began to wither away. Not only did our movement make a full stop, but our sustenance shifted from food that was pure and immediate in consumption to a typology requiring a new process of preparation. Excess food supply came into play as humans saved their unconsumed crops for difficult times ahead. Humans believed that they had finally conquered their food supply and consequently had control of their survival destiny. Difficult times triggered by hunger became rarer and when they did, humans could no longer cope with the hunger's mental, emotional, and physical challenges. As inactivity became routine, and as the concept goes, you lose what you don't use, 
our vast abilities deteriorated to the few critical senses necessary for the times. A physiological change had taken place, and a consequential psychological evolution ensued. Humanity's perception of hunger had shifted. No longer was it our valued partner throughout the life journey. Hunger now meant our total failure, and by then, fear had forced its way into the human mind. Every action onwards from that moment in history was to avoid hunger and treat it as the enemy to our existence. Humans took it upon themselves to make sure that hunger would cease as a cause of future pain, suffering, and eventual death. Century after century, we pushed hunger further and further away. Away from our sight, away from our experience, and away from our reality. Hunger had to be overcome, and in that resolute effort, abundance became our savior. More and more abundance, till it became too much. After the agricultural revolution, the world witnessed an abundance of a predictable food supply, but it also triggered a restructuring exercise of our daily life cycle. Labor was now the new purpose, and its efficiency the ultimate goal. Humans had to be able to produce the most crops possible, and to feed this laborious lifestyle, certain levels of energy were required to sow and reap the fields. A mid-morning repast became our first planned meal. Shortly after rising from our sleep, humans infused themselves with considerable sustenance to provide more than enough energy for the farming ritual. Different civilizations addressed meals varyingly, but all systems revolved around what was best for their specific type of agriculture, in terms of timing and produce. For many millennia, humans were eating a single regular late morning meal every day. And even then, many luminaries throughout these changing times attempted to get humanity to understand that the systemic one meal a day was not the way of our ancestors, and definitely not the path in achieving the highest version of ourselves. In the Middle Ages, another meal was introduced later in the day to replenish the additional energies expended in a constantly evolving and laboring population. As the centuries passed, and by the 17th century, Higher social status drove an upward trend in the quantity of meals. The richer, the greater the number of meals. Those with more means had three daily meals, while others of lower status maintained the two meal a day routine. In the early 19th century, the interests of the Industrial Revolution pushed for longer working hours. And to sustain this marathon of labor, a new meal was slotted earlier into the day, immediately after rising from our sleep. There was no excuse for being ill-prepared for offering the highest work output, especially one related to food. Soon after, people became conditioned that sustenance was necessary at the beginning, middle, and end of the day. Since then, rarely have we experienced any actual hunger at all. An innate disposition was established to destroy any chance of hunger through a round-the-clock numbing strategy of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and to repeat incessantly. From the first moment of consciousness, we rarely go without food for a period beyond a four to five hour window, regardless of what our body might actually require in terms of nourishment. A further psychological shift led to the phenomenon of hedonic hunger. Our body's voice was silenced and the mind started driving humanity to eat more and more, regardless of any real necessity. More meals became a part of our daily consumerist language. Second breakfast, snacks, brunch, tea, supper, pre and post workout, and on and on. Our connection to food became overwhelming. Food was ritual. Ritual became an irreplaceable source of pleasure. Food was ethereal and omnipresent all powerful. We are consuming food beyond what humanity would require were it still working with the physical or mental drains of the industrial age.
we don't need all this energy. Our lives are different. Our industry is different. So shouldn't our consumption definitely be different? We all know we must reduce our intake to maintain a healthy lifestyle. But who wants to go back to the days of hunger and suffering? Yet at the same time, how do we explain this urge to fast? To limit consumption even though food is pleasure and contentment? Is there a long lost memory that's still trying to resurface? Of a potential that can be unlocked with a positive and constructive relationship to hunger? What awaits for us across the fasting divide? A better existence? Less pain? Healthier, happier? More fulfillment? A better version of ourselves? Our journey from hunger to fasting is almost complete. Having told our story, we are at the precipice of learning from our past and transcending our modern consuming behavior. No one is saying that we should go back to our days of hunger. We're way past our ancient superhuman status. And to say that we can quickly regain our long lost gifts and abilities through fasting is wishful thinking. Especially in light of our current way of life, thought processes, and pre-existing conditioning. Our first priority is to get back on the correct path concerning our eating habits and avoid subjecting ourselves to any branded revolutionary fasting technique or conventional dietary system. Quick fixes are not our aspiration. A healthier, in control, and significantly longer life is. Achieving our goals includes a multi-stage process composed of two stages. For any truly life-changing process to take effect, we must first establish an environment that greatly increases the chances of success. This environment is created by introducing fasting as a daily exercise that works its way in small steps towards breaking free of our eating habits. As with other physical activity, if not practiced, fasting can be extremely tough. So start easy and gradually build your endurance up to longer periods of food abstinence. No one really wakes up in the morning feeling hungry, even if they were fairly hungry getting to bed the night before. Push your regular eating hours later in the day. Avoid the convention of a mandatory breakfast prior to commencing your daily routine. As your day progresses, see how you feel and if subsequently you do feel hungry, try a mid-morning breakfast as opposed to one from the very beginnings of your day. The more you push the gaps between feeding times, the more you allow for true hunger to appear. At first, a light panic might trigger your fears, red flagging that eating is necessary or else something bad will happen. This is typically your cravings coming into their own, pushing you to consume. As you maintain your fasting, the familiarity with hunger will begin to normalize. The more exposure to hunger, the more you will begin to appreciate that hunger, as in all our other senses, is sending us extremely accurate information. Once you achieve a level of comfort with fasting of 8 to 12 conscious hours, then you've entered into intermittent fasting territory. As ominous as it sounds, the introduction of fasting in itself is not the intended goal. The outcome of this stage is not to overcome your habits, behavior, or even to break down any ritual. Although there might be many positive side effects to this stage, the immediate goal is to get to know hunger and shift it from the domain of fear and towards an honest, internal dialogue between your preconditioned mental cravings and your actual physical hunger. Upon achieving this dialogue, you are now ready to proceed to the next stage of our process. Following the familiarization to hunger, we must now ask ourselves certain fundamental questions concerning our consumption of food so that we can address the core of our eating challenges. Why am I eating? How much am I eating? And what am I eating? These questions weigh differently on our body and mind. So let's break down the fundamentals into two main categories, the internal and the external domains. 
We begin with the internal domain, which asks the why question and deals with our mental and emotional processes. The answer is simple. We are looking for a reason to eat. In today's world, we eat for many reasons that come before the reason for sustenance. We eat for comfort, pleasure, boredom, security, habit, ritual, engagement, and so on. Hunger is pretty far down the reasons line. Our end game is to consciously weed out this list of reasons to one single reason, and that's hunger. Our first lesson is to reduce your reasons for eating with hunger being the primary one. Easier said than done, you're probably telling yourself. You'd be right. Without other tools that can facilitate our situation, we won't be a match for pleasure, comfort, or boredom. Enter awareness. When we were oblivious to the world as newborn babies, we were fed round the clock as we were without a voice. We couldn't speak as to whether we were hungry or if we required any food at all. More often than not, it was just a preordained time to be fed. Isn't that what crying was for? To tell our carers that we were struggling and possibly hungry? And now as adults, our body's voice is still silent. Well, to be exact, not silent, but we simply aren't listening. Our bodies are intelligent communicators, relaying clear messages as long as we are open to listening, informing us of what is necessary for our well-being and what is not. Open your mind. Listen. 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 In the event of any type of hunger rising, the first step is to separate yourself from the hunger you are feeling. Know what it is or what it isn't. Is it asking for pleasure and satiety? Or is it a true warning due to depleted physical energies? Remove yourself from the question of should I or shouldn't I eat? Analyze the symptoms of your hunger situation. If you desire the food and can literally taste it, then more likely than not, this is hedonic hunger, triggering your cravings with a call to action. But if the trigger is based on a differing need, a physical calling where your body is asking for sustenance, represented through an emptiness within your gut, in addition to an existing or intuited downward shift of energy, then most probably this is the time to feed. Our next lesson, open your mind and truly listen to your body. But again, awareness is not easy. It is slightly easier than reason to contemplate, but still requires another critical tool that can offer exponential assistance in facilitating the presence of the right frame of mind. Haven't you ever gone for many hours or even days without your typical eating routine? When sick, sad, or working in overdrive, our appetite seems to fade away into oblivion due to our concentrated state of mind. We literally forget our hedonic ways. Both our conscious and subconscious drown out all other behavioral tendencies towards food and focus exclusively on the current mental, emotional, or physical adversity before us and how we can transcend them. Although subconsciously driven, all these states are invisible intentions meant to bring to the forefront a specific existence above all others easily overwhelming even our most ritualized habits, such as eating. This exhibits how hunger in its current manifestation is a mind game, and shows how if clear intentions to deprioritize hunger exist, subconsciously or not, then hunger can be overcome as a fear and an enemy. An additional example of how intention operates comes from most, if not all, religions. All fasts begin with a very conscious and clear declaration of intent to fast. This act helps manage the expectations of the fasting population and sets their frame of mind not to expect any sustenance for a certain period of time. Do the same with your daily eating habits. Decide not to eat in a systemic, structured and controlled manner. Make it acceptable mentally and emotionally to miss the breakfasts the lunches or dinners. Every morning as you rise and when hunger is far from thought, 
announce your daily eating intentions. So to recap, we begin with intention, which leads to awareness, and then leads to reason. Each moment empowers the subsequent moment. Now let's summarize the first sequence of lessons. Lesson one, announce your daily eating intentions. Lesson two, open your mind and truly listen to your body. Lesson three, reduce your reasons for eating with hunger being the primary reason. We've concluded the lessons specific to the internal domain. Now let's shift to the external domain, which deals with our physical processes. We come back to the two remaining original questions. How much am I eating? What am I eating? Let's address the first. Again, the solution is looking us straight in the face. Our body is a supernatural machine. It can cope with most diseases, injuries, and toxins introduced within. So even if you do eat something that is not necessarily great for your well-being, as long as it's an exception, our bodies will self-cleanse. Unfortunately, with today's eating habits, our bodies are bombarded with exaggerated quantities and inferior qualities of food. Although quantity of food can be addressed in two ways, quantity of meals and quantity of food during a meal, let us focus on quantity in terms of number of meals. As effective as our bodies are at self-healing and being machines, they can also become run down with excessive operations. If we calculate the meals consumed to date by the average 50-year-old, the total will accrue to 55,000 meals. For an 80-year-old, this will equate to 87,000 meals. If we follow an eating routine that reflects a feeding based on real hunger, then these figures will probably drop closer to 20,000 to 35,000 for the 50-year-old, and 30,000 to 50,000 for the 80-year-old. Imagine a machine that goes through 50% less effort in terms of digestion and dealing with harmful toxins. With this simple rule of moderation, our bodies would be younger and healthier due to less processing, stress, and detoxification. Our lesson, reduce the number of meals to between one to two a day. To answer the second question, what am I eating? The answer becomes much more personalized. There is no one finite solution. Balance intends to diversify the typology of foods taken in during a specific cycle of a week or a month. Balance is achieved between consuming living foods, such as fruits and vegetables, and non-living foods that include a wider array of cooked ingredients as well as uncooked elements such as nuts, seeds, and others. If possible, try to keep the first meal heavily composed of living foods. For example, focus on fruits, and if required, adding uncooked non-living foods. While any subsequent meal for the day should include a mix of living and non-living foods. There is no science to this process, merely a trial and error exercise till you find the post-meal balance of physical satisfaction and mental comfort. Our lesson is to discover your personal meal compositions. You've heard it many times before. Most perceived hunger is actually thirst or dehydration. Your mind sending mixed signals that your body needs to feed. Imagine if you replaced a meal you recently had that was based on your questionable hunger with a preemptive glass or two of water. The life source of our existence. Water is a cleanser, both internally and externally. Our body's fabric is in majority composed of water. Why wouldn't water be one of the critical solutions to improved eating habits? Start your day with a glass of water. Keep up a regular intake that maintains your hydration, but also avoid any excess that might be pushing your personal capacity. Drink water consistently throughout your day. So let's recap again our next three lessons. Lesson four, reduce the number of meals to between one to two a day. Lesson five, discover your personal meal compositions. 
Lesson 6. Drink water consistently throughout your day. What is right for you is not necessarily what's right for the next person. There is no correct dietary system or method that is applicable to us all. A standard lifestyle diet, keto, vegetarianism, veganism, carnivorism, pescatarian, and all others have their merits. But the need to feed system can apply to all these diets or lifestyles and is flexible to accommodate most people. There is no actual fasting or diet with the need to feed system. There is a lifestyle of eating that is reason-driven eating. Time should not be the driver for the act of eating. By avoiding this bit of convention and combating modernity's relentless intake of food, fasting becomes a byproduct of deregulating our eating habits. We're also not making any claims that food shouldn't be a source of pleasure and within the same system, establish the same intentions for the pleasures of eating, as you would for your hunger-based meals. Don't lock out pleasure, but keep it controlled and try hard to limit its recurrence. This system is really about power, to empower humanity and take back control over its own physical existence. When it comes to eating, the preconditioned mind has been totally destructive as it's been programmed over many decades to consume again and again, irrespective of real hunger. The need to feed approach helps us recondition to be in control and not to be swayed by our pre-existing rituals. We want to be better, live healthier and longer. We want our sense of hunger back to help us as a constructive tool and maybe, just maybe, be our redemption. Good luck to you all.